welcome everyone. We're waiting just a moment as people join us. We're so excited that you're all here. Um, we are welcoming Fulton Leroy Washington, known as Mr. Wash today to be our guest speaker. And um, if we could go to the next slide, I'll show you one of his paintings. Mr. Wash is an artist and this painting is called Deteriorating. And um, we're gonna talk about that in just a minute, but I want to let you know that um, uh, Mr. Wash was born in Tallulah, Louisiana, but he's lived in Los Angeles since 1954 when he was one year old. He worked as a welder, a contractor, and a vocational trainer, um, and was married with eight children. He was convicted in the late 1990s of nonviolent drug offenses and sentenced to life in prison. During his incarceration, Mr. Wash began to draw and then to paint. Um, he painted fellow inmates, often in scenes where they were living free. Eventually, he was inspired by this next painting, which is um, painted by Francis um, Bicknell Carpenter. And it's, it depicts President Lincoln and his signing of the Emancipation Proclamation. The Emancipation Proclamation was signed on January 1st, 1863. And it was a proclamation that changed the legal status under federal law of more than three and a half million enslaved African-Americans um, in the um, secessionist Confederate states and changed their status from enslaved to free. Uh, Mr. Wash painted a version of this painting that imagined himself being granted, granted clemency um, by President Obama. Um, and then, in fact, Mr. Wash was granted clemency in 2016. He was freed after 21 years of imprisonment, and he's still working to prove his innocence today. You can follow um, and view more of his work on his website, www.artbywash.com, and you can follow him on Instagram at Mr. Wash the Artist, and we'll put those later into the chat as well. Um, Mr. Wash would like to say um, a few words of acknowledgement. And while he's doing that, we will look at his um, painting deteriorating. Good afternoon, everybody. I, I, feel, I feel nervous, please stop. No, listen, I, I really, I wanna give thanks. I wanna give honor and thanks to uh, USC and to La Jolla Country Day School, to Amy, the rest of the team and staff, for hosting me today and allowing me to be here and be part of your life. I really want to give acknowledgement and honor to you, to all the people who's joining today for sharing your time with me, you know, and, to, and for taking an interest in either my art or my story or both. So thank you very much. So Amy's going to ask some questions and then y'all will get a chance to chat. And then we all gonna sit back and have a good time. Could you tell us um, the story of how you came to start painting in prison? Um, where were you? Were you self-taught? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, the story of how I became to become like a portrait artist, a, uh, artist period, is I was at NBCLA, which is the Federal Detention Center downtown LA next to the Teen Freeway. And my attorney asked me one day after I was convicted, I got a new attorney for sentencing and Karen, which is my attorney, she asked me to try to draw a sketch. You know, I had been drawing cards and envelopes and, you know, helping people with their writing. I have very decent penmanship. So I would write, you know, help guys write their letters and stuff. And then I would draw little pictures of doodles, butterflies and caterpillars or little deers or whatever picture they bring. I could just kind of sketch it out on the card or the envelope and send it, and send it home. And a lot of interest started coming. People started coming actually to do that. Well, my attorney was in the visiting room several times and noticed that every time I would come in, all the heads would turn and they would start to point. And she was like, what is it that you do that they keep talking about you did it? And I brought a group of uh, greeting cards and Valentine cards and stuff that I had designed and drew and showed it to her. And she said, you're really good. Can you draw maybe the people that you was working with that, that would help? So I drew this sketch and I'm really kind of not ashamed of it. I'm really grateful for it, but it don't look nothing like what I do now. It was kind of like a kid sketch, you know, 
the guy had this kind of hair and his forehead, you know, you exaggerate all the different portions of her face. And she took that, that sketch and she actually went and found the people. And that started my career. And I was so grateful that I broke down in tears in courtroom when I saw those people for the first time in over a year and something that I had worked around. And I only could really remember, I remember the, the characters and what people did on the job, but not so much what they looked like. So I had to, was this one guy who really stood out because he had long dreadlocks and he was a kind of older guy. And, uh, and I found somebody who looked something, a head like his, and I modified it. And enough to where she found them. And um, they were out passing the flyers out. The kids was following them around through the neighborhood begging. She turned and told one of the students from uh, Southwestern University who was helping her pass them out to just give them one so they could get away. And that was the trigger. That, that one act of uh, unconditional gifting. So that the way that she gave that to them and they gave back, it's been a back and forth with that back and forth of giving. You know, we all are here to help one another to make it through. So when you hold back, you really hold your own blessings away. And when she gave that up, they said, oh, I know him. That's Jerry. And they went and they found him. Then she asked me to, you know, she took the sketch and put it part of my court record. So I guess anybody go in there to paste it and pull it up through the thing, you'll probably see the sketch because it's part of the it's part of the court record now. And this is what helped track down some witnesses for that were important to your case. Is yes, that right? it did. She, they, from that there, that found him. He was able to identify other people and they bring in about six or seven people. And they all gave testimony that I was like miles, miles away at the time. I'm here working when they say I was somewhere else buying chemicals. And eventually we did find the people who bought the chemicals and we're in court now trying to get a hearing on that. Wow, that's just such an amazing story. I know you faced a lot of obstacles in prison um, to being able to paint. Could you talk about what some of those obstacles were and how that was for you? Man, the, the, the obstacles in the first start, it was really, really crazy. Because first of all, the, the main obstacle is that in the prison they sent me to is 4,000 people on an average from 3,700 to 4,000. And the art room only holds nine a 10. So it's not a lot of space. So anybody who wants to get in has to, you know, get in line to get in. And then you have to wait till somebody leaves. And if everybody in there, the majority of people in there, nobody in there had less than 20 years. So when you come in as new, you, you got years to wait for a spot. And um, so anyway, I went through that. Then I went through the part that when I did get in, they really didn't want me in there because I was innocent. I kept, you know, it was all over the yard. He's innocent. I mean, if he's innocent, he's he's the police. He's he's not one of us. So then I was not accepted on that ground as a person that could be trustworthy about uh, whatever goes on inside. Um, then after that kind of calmed down and everybody had their space, everybody kind of be, be by themselves anyway, they was, a lot of the people gave me the wrong advice to try to dissuade me from, from painting. They, first, they told me to paint apples and oranges and you know different things and not to try to paint people, that it was the hardest thing to paint. And um, anyway, I didn't know how, I didn't know how to make colors. And so I painted all people primary and secondary colors. I think one of the early on pictures was um, a picture that I titled Armistad, uh, Slaves in a Ship, where I just used red and black to paint the whole picture. Uh, the next one, I painted my daughter green and then my grandson blue, you know, and I tried to, you know, develop the, the, the shape and form of the human face just with lights and darks. It's like you take a color picture and turn it into a black and white. So it's the same thing. It just, I have one light color. I have one dark color. This would be the light. This would be the dark. And I just push them back and forth and keep going. First year, after going through all the obstacles of even, um, they was telling me to buy the wrong brushes. And then when they get tired of a brush or wear one out, they would break it in half or several pieces and throw it in the trash and trash to say there's a brush. And I would get it out, tape it together, get some glue, glue it, wait a couple of days. And I had this crooked brush and I'm, and, you know, I'm working with it. And you know, what's really funny, this is really funny right here because some of those brushes I still have today. 
I still have the brushes from 1997 and 1998. I never got rid of them. I kept those brushes as a reminder of how grateful to, ha to be able to have a new brush. And to, once I learned what brushes do and why there were so many different types and styles, and I'm still learning, you know, because we are limited in prison to what we can order. We can't order anything we want. We can only order school grade. And I have yet to actually get start to use professional equipment, professional thinners and oils and stuff like that. I haven't had that experience yet. So, and, uh, and yet with all those limitations, you still went on and won the art contest, didn't you? Yeah, yeah I, actually, <laughs> I actually won on the first year. And I, I really think that I didn't win. I don't consider this is me talking right now. Whoever wants to judge, they have to judge on their own merit. But I don't believe that I won because I was the best artist. Because I really believe that the guys was in there was a lot better. They had skills. They understood how to do things. It didn't take them a long time to get it done. Uh, I think what caused me to win within the first year is the boldness of creation, you know, to let what's inside of you to come out, to be, to dare to be different, to make people think different and have an emotional impact. Instead of just painting an apple or orange, what if you painted an orange with legs or orange with arms trying to pull itself or, or orange holding on to the tree because when you try to pull him off, he didn't rest. That's like kind of cartoon realistic. You know, I would take the thoughts in my mind and do my best to turn them into something that people could understand. And I, if, and I, hope, I don't know if this picture still exists now, but the picture that actually took the first place uh, and actually was published in the, on the front page of the, I think it was the Kansas City Star newspaper. It was called No ID. I painted a picture of a young black kid with his pants sagging down right, with his underwear showing, with no shirt on, holding up the American flag. And the flag was on fire, burning him up, but he wouldn't let it go. He was still trying to uphold the American flag. And so when the newspaper came through the prison and I'm trying to make this picture come to life and I don't know how to paint fire. Fire is not really just like painted red. And I'm learning as you try to get it, you got to really blend these yellows and oranges and some translucent purple grays and to create this fire. And then I'm not really getting it, but I'm trying. And they walk through and they like, I feel them standing behind my back. They're not saying anything. They call, say, come here. They look in over my shoulder. And, it's, and one lady, she say, you, you, you painted the flag? You're burning the flag? Uh, yes. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> you know, I mean, I painted a picture of the flag burning. She said, well, what does it mean? Well, I said, oh, this painting right here means it tells a story about how in America that the black man don't have no ID. It's titled No ID. So no matter what happens, he still supports and try to uphold the United States, but he's never just because, you know, of the color of his skin that he's put through all this punishment. Now, you got to remember that this is a person who's sitting in prison, have not been to court to be sentenced yet. And your counselor is saying, you have two life sentences and you never committed a crime. So you're sitting there saying, wow, man, why me? And you read the paperwork, the documents where there were two black men. So that's where the whole phrase come from, no ID. When you read the indictment in, in the criminal complaint, there were two black men, right? And I matched the description. I'm a black man, but the man was five foot four. I'm over six feet tall. How do that match the description? Well, you're black. <laughs> anyway, that, that's what no ID stood for, is that there's no face on the picture. There's no face on the picture. The back is turned. It's just a, a black man wearing the kind of style clothes that black people wear, which I didn't, I don't, that's not how I dress. Um, and so anyway, three minutes. That's fascinating. <laughs> well, you know, that's a great intro into our next question, which is about, you know, can we talk about a, a painting that demonstrates your unique style? Mr. Norland, can you show us um, the things we cry for? Can you walk us through some of the technique and the symbolism? Well, I think if each, every one of my paintings, I try to tell a story. 
I don't want to just like just paint just to be painting and slashing color around. I mean, we have to, and, and I don't want to just leave it open for the imagination all the time. I want to be left open for thought of imagination, but not for full interpretation. I want to make a statement and I was uh, compelled to write the stories of the people that was around me because when I went into the prison system, I saw that everybody in there was living in fear. They were in fear. You know, the, the guards were afraid of the inmates. The inmates were afraid of the guards. Uh, inmates were afraid of each other. The East Coast afraid of the West Coast. West Coast afraid. And so these people had a lot of things in common. And the most thing they had in common was fear. Then the other was that they were all sad, that they all had loved ones that they had left behind. As I heard their stories and uh, I got compelled after painting the first teardrop picture, I painted it myself because I was in the art room painting and I didn't listen to the radio. I had given my radio away and I didn't watch TV. So I stayed either trying to learn how to paint or trying to do legal work to get out of prison. And the two was working together hand in hand. People would send in donations for their artwork and that money would go directly to the lawyers or whatever to help try to get my freedom. So one day I'm in there and I'm painting and my buddy Cal Triver, he's a great artist. I looked over his shoulder on many a day and he was playing this country song by Tim McGraw. Uh, and we have that. Uh, Mr. Norlin can play that for us. Should he, should he play it? And then you could. All morning I've been thinking my life so hard and they wore everything they own living in a car. I wanted to tell them it would be okay, but I just got in my suburban and I, I drove away. And I don't know why they say grown men don't cry. So I listened to that song and it's Tim McGraw told a story about how he was traveling to get to his wife and family. And I thought about, I had left my wife and my children behind and how vulnerable they was, you know, out there without any guidance, without any protection, without the support that a father brings to the home. And I started to cry. And when I say I started to cry, I cried like a baby, but I couldn't make a sound because I'm in prison around people who would really try to take advantage of you if they find some vulnerability. And I grabbed my face and held it and I hid behind and I'm just trying not to let it come out because I know if it come out, I'm not going to be able to stop. And then I'm going to have to fight after that because somebody's going to say something stupid and I'm not, I might not be able to take it. So long story short, when it was all said and done, I decided to go back and draw my feelings out. And I went out on the yard, I drew a sketch and I went out and I leaned over the wall and I put my hands like this, kind of like the Hillary painting. And I just looked and I painted, I drew, took the picture, had them to take a picture and I came back and sketched it out and I drew myself. And then I drew tears running down my face and down my arm. And I put in those tears, the first thing that I remember happened when the marriage fell apart, where my wife was saying she couldn't go anymore. So we sit in the living room holding hands. I redrew that scene. And then down the arm, in the tear on the arm, I painted my daughter waving by daddy. You know, and uh, inside of the eyeballs, I went in the eyeballs and imagined myself in a tower prison, like a tower of a castle looking out like this, like watching my life walk away from me. When I painted that picture, it became emotional to not just uh, the prisoners who were there, but the guards as well, everybody. It's like, my God, man, you know, it's so, it was just, and it's really a bad painting. It's not, it's not like what I do now, really it's not. I really have to really develop this teardrop thing, but it was such an impact on everybody that that vulnerable state that people were living in, they open up and they would talk to me. You know, come in, Miss Washington, I'll talk to you for a minute. Man, I was in there crying last night, man. You know, you, you have kids. What can I do to, you know, help save my family? What can I do to uh, 
uh, uh, support my kids. Well, how old are you? You know, I had children at, at that time from 20 down to two. So I had a little range in, in between there. And I would, you know, I would console them and talk to them. But when you look at those pictures uh, on things we cry for, you see in the faces of those, those inmates. Could you put that back on the screen just for a second, please? Things we cry for. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of stories, a lot of stories uh, in there. You could just, if you really just like look at them and just, and, and you will see that you got some people with anger, like look at the guy at the top. He was very mad that he was taken away from his children. Look at the one up on him, which is Eslo. He got the bars, the two bars running across his face. He was deeply hurt. He was only 20 something years old, like 26, 27 years old, you know? Um, you look at the one in the middle right above things where the guy has his hand over his heart because he was really, um, wanted forgiveness you know he wanted forgiveness and and that's what came out in his story as he told me his his story he wanted forgiveness for the things that he had done and i tried to capture that so i would take him out on the yard i would position them into positions take the picture of them bring it back now bring me all the people that you want the forgiveness to go to and then i would try to tell that as a story um you look at hillary John McCain, uh, President Obama, mothers missing their children. So all of the, the, the teardrops were not just people in prison. Sometimes the request came from the streets of the parents of the child that was in prison, brokenhearted that their child is gone. And a lot of mothers and fathers would send pictures because they didn't lost their child for life. Sometimes they come in, you know, 20, 22 years old with a 60 or 70 year sentence and they're old men now. The one next to it, loving a convict, this was my way of telling my family, my uh, failed marriage, you know, I tried, I tried, I tried, I, I held on as long as they held on, you know, and eventually my wife said she couldn't go anymore and you know, you see the picture has the woman fingernails to represent the, the, the wife and the wedding band to represent the man trying to hold it together. Down the middle are my children, not all of them, but the ones that I had pictures of that I could paint. And then my grandchildren as they were born and they would send pictures in sharing uh, my next generation. I start capturing them into the picture. Finally, it got to a point, it's like, okay, I'm gonna wrap this up and move on. Um, Yes, the, you know, time went past, but this is called loving a convict. And it kind of tells the story that, look, it don't matter whether you put the husband, the wife, or the child, they have family and that family love them. And that, even though they're convicted, it's not going to change the love. So this is loving a convict and the story of my family and my family's life that we did the last, um, right now it's been 25 years that so we're still in court fighting. Wow. Yeah, we've been Mr. Lush, this is just incredible. My goodness. Maybe we can move to the next clip, which is Eric Tears. And, and you know, you can you can talk a little bit about how that relates to helping others in prison. Eric Tears is one of the paintings that's on display right now at the Hammer Museum. Um, and Eric had a story, you know, he had a, a very young child, uh, a, a baby, not even a toddler, less than a toddler when he came in. And uh, he told his story. He came in. Uh, I forget where he's from. I think he's like South Carolina or somewhere. And um, so we did we did his picture. And his picture is one of the paintings that was selected uh, for the Made in LA 2020. Uh, hopefully the museum's open soon. Everybody can go down and get a really close up look. I, this is a good photograph, but it does not do justice for the painting. Really, he has some really nice, bright colors. Um, uh, my technique and style in this is to kind of shift. See, he didn't have these clothes on. That's another thing too. Some of the clothes I create out of my mind because when I was in high school, going to Gardena High School and also in at Perry, we had home economics and I learned how to sew and to make clothes. So what I remember from learning in that it, it comes over. So these clothes you see on here, the gold chain, when I went to Centennial High School, 
I took jury shop and I learned how to take wire and twist it into S loops, beat it with a hammer and make it into these herringbone chains and stuff. So that memory of the past carries on into the future, into everything that you do. So, yeah. Well, let's move to the the timeline chart that you made, because I think it would be wonderful to hear how you stayed um, resilient in prison. And I think uh, this might speak to that a little bit. Yeah, this is a, this timeline chart right here. We actually, I had this chart when I was 20 years old and, you know, coming out of high school, um, at buying, buying my second house. I bought my first house when I was 17, left home at 15. Got 20 years old. I had about 70, 7,300 days. That's all I had lived, 7,300 days. And, and I have a child now. I have a baby. And the, the, so a lot of y'all, but then your first, by the time you get 20, if you get, you start in your family, you ain't live about 7,000 days. And if you live to be 100, you only get 36,500. So uh, this time I tried helped me to keep my life in order and not to waste any time because out of everything that you can get out of this life, the one thing that you can't get back is time. Time waits for no one. So be careful how you use it because it's the most valuable asset that you have. And I, and I, I promise you that when you look at this chart, do you think about this? When I went to prison, I was 42 years old. When I came out of prison, I was 63 years old. I'm 67 years old now. How much time do I have left? Just looking at the chart. See, the chart is a constant reminder. You know, you're 15 years old, 17 years old, you're in college, you know, y'all having a good time. But you can let that time slip away. You can spend, find yourself real easy four or five years just partying and just, you know, whatever. And before you know it, you have no time left. So keep in mind, keep this chart and kind of think of this in uh, as an exercise that I do with a chart like this, I might write over the top of the days because you could break each five years down into days and each day in the 24 hours. So you can figure out, well, what do you do with your time in a 24 hour period? How much of the time do you waste doing this and how much positive stuff? But you also can write just like on a weekly chart what was the best thing that happened for me this week? And then what was the worst thing that happened to me this week? What, what was the three best things that happened to me this week? Right at the top. And then you write on the bottom, right up under it, what was the worst best thing, the worst things that happened to me? And do that week by week for a while and then go back and look at it and look at your own life and see what you did with it. Would you say that everything was good? You know, what? because each thing you write on there, it's like, what did you trade your time for? Okay, hypothetical example. I trade my time. I went to the, to the, to the football game, you know. Uh, I went to the club, you know. I went and visited a friend, you know. I got stuck in the rain. I had a flat tire. I did this, you know, did that. You put good decisions, bad decisions. You could, there's a lot of ways you could use the time chart. Be creative. It's a chart that's, that's freely being offered as a way – to look backwards over your life without, it's like keeping a diary, but you're keeping it on a timeline now, not just day by day, but you're able to look back on a chart and see it. I hope that helps. Oh, it's amazing. Yeah, and I'm just thinking about um, how you don't waste a minute of your time now. I mean, I feel as though you barely sleep. Can, can you tell us about you know, what your typical pattern is? My typical pattern is that my phone is set not to, ring or disturb from uh from 10 o'clock at night to seven in the morning i normally get up and wake up about three or four o'clock most of the time by four something i'm up out the bed i've already taken my shower i already prayed to god to thank him that i'm here and asking him who can i help today and then i get started with you know with my artwork with trying to read and catch up to learn how to use the computer how to use the phone i watch my youtube uh or something. Yeah, I just I just try to do positive. It's always is a constantly changing what we have to do on a day by day. But I try to get all of that in. I try to learn something every day. I want to learn something new. Uh, I want to exercise what I already know, and I want to share what I have with somebody. You know what I'm saying? So I kind of look for uh, two people a day 
to give unconditional help or support to it. You know, and so my day starts off with sometimes these paintings, I'm in here painting on paintings. Um, people want illustrations for their book, children books. Uh, some people just need somebody to talk to. And so my phone rings and I get to talk. <laughs> well, that's that's a typical day. You've been so generous um, it, with with me in, in preparing for today. Um, I'm just so honored. I mean, I know sometimes you've got calls coming in from NPR and from around the world and from Ugg Boots and all of these, these places, but you always say, no, I, I set aside this time to talk to you. Yeah. And I, just, I find that so Amy, generous. Amy, I mean, I feel that you're a blessing in my life. And as I said, when we first came on, I'm, I'm really honored to be able to share with the next generation, you know? And that's one of the things about this life is that, you know, we can't survive on our own. You know, we are probably one of, we are probably really, even though we're the dominant species on the planet, we are really the most vulnerable. We cannot survive. That's why everybody keep moving to the cities because the majority of people need company. They need somebody. And so you, we have to help one another if we're gonna ever become elevated to prosper in the universe. Let's use those words, okay? Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, that makes me think, I mean, I, I feel as though um, there's a lot of hope on the horizon. And I was so touched when at um, the inauguration of our new president, Joe Biden, by Amanda Gorman's poem. And remember the line where she said, what just is, isn't always justice. Yeah. And so I wanted to ask, you know, what do you, what do you think of that line? And what do you think of our criminal justice system? And Well, I think that she was amazing. I was really, I really heard, she can, I'm not a speaker. <laughs> That girl could speak. I mean, she came and she did she did her thing. She was very proud and precise in, in, in what she do. You know, that is a form of art. And if that's her spirit coming out in her form, she's beautiful. And, and she need to, I mean, just, just do it. I think that like her, her poem said, she said what, she said what just is, is not always justice. And I felt that because I have a phrase that I coined and I actually have it printed on, on, on some of the washwear t-shirts uh, that's available online. It says, it is what it is, but it ain't what it looked like. And that right there comes a phrase that I coined because of my experience in the criminal justice system. I was believing all the time, living my whole life out 40 something years you know, paying my taxes and doing everything, that this is what it is, that we have a fair law. Even though we have some, you know, mistreats, I got mistreatments coming along the way. I got beat like Rodney King four or five times when I was a teenager, you know, and once when I was an adult. But you just put it past that it is what it is, you know? So, but when I got arrested and charged, for something that I didn't do and given a life sentence, I really understood that it is what it is, but it ain't what it looked like. When they changed the words in the document, when they changed the evidence and they did all of that, I realized that it is what it is, but it ain't what it looked like. So our criminal justice system, and go back, to answer your question, yes, I think she's right. I think she's right. And our criminal justice system need to be reformed. I think that the, the, monet the monetization of it has corrupted it, you know, and not just, not just in the, the building of prisons, but also in how the ones that's already inside of a prison, that the salary they paid is dependent upon crime. Crime is by design. If the, if the numbers get low and you don't have enough people coming in, then they'll change, rewrite the law and make something else a crime. You know, so this whole thing is in order to keep each industry, uh, each institution growing. And each one have to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. They don't have a, a ceiling on it. They have to always bring in new people, uh, hire more staff, get more equipment, more trucks, more vans, more buses. Every department wants to grow and everything needs capital 
but all capital come from people. So you keep punishing people in order, you know, so you, you're storing your part of your citizens in just as the energy, as the fuel to keep this institution and the economy growing. It needs to be reformed. It well, needs to, instead of, listen, if everybody that goes to prison has to get out one day, then it should be a whole reform system, a rehabilitation system. The system should be fixing things, not taking and take a person like using me for an example. 20 something years, you can't use a computer? The technology come out and you don't, it's like, how do you turn it on? Where, you know, where's the switch? You know, right now I'm scared to click on stuff because I didn't have three, three blue screens of death. <laughs> I don't know if y'all are aware of what the blue screen of death is, but on uh, the HP computer, the screen just turns blue and all of your data is gone. Everything is gone. So, the, you know, the prison sent me all of a lot of my records, my file, my court documents, everything on on the disk. And I put it in the computer. Now, we never had that in prison. We never had a blue screen. They got a lot of firewalls or whatever. I come on, get me a computer and turn that thing on. I'm not in there about two and a half months and it go blue and I don't know what to do. And I lose it. I le I didn't know how to turn it off or what I should turn it off with that corrupted file. And it just sit there and spin until it burnt a hole in the disk. When I finally took it down and it had like, I had like six or seven terabytes of information that oh. got corrupted. I'm so yeah. sorry, Mr. Wash. Yeah. Well, let's let's have Mr. Um, Norlin put up the um, the the picture of, of Mondain's market, because I think that relates to a lot of the things you're saying about um, about the corruption in, in the criminal justice system and, and kind of the, um, the really broad ranging effects that it has um, on communities. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, for instance, like the loss of generational wealth. And, yeah, I think Mr. Mondain is a, is a perfect example of a person who had, uh, had established himself in, in society to not just serve society, but also to create generational wealth for, for, his, for, his, for his family, his generation. Uh, according to Mondain's story, and according to the people who came from the town and city where he lived as well, there were four bees markets there, or several bees markets. And Mr. Mondain owned them. And, but being arrested and sent to federal prison, uh, they were taken from him. You know, they was confiscated by the government, which took the generational wealth away from his family line. And now uh, Mr. Mundane is blind now. Um, he's out of prison. He didn't have to do the life sentence, but he can't see. And so we wouldn't have found this penny. We bring it back. But I think that Mr. Mundane is a perfect example of how a person would spend their lifetime building up, knowing that what they've acquired and put together is more than what they can use, right? For their self in their lifetime so they do it anyway because they have children and they have grandchildren is also is to leave something behind for the next generation to start with and that was taken from mr mundane you know he lost that i went actually went to kansas city that building is still there looking just like that building but it's now a record studio a record recording studio so all of his enterprise and uh, selling, uh, selling food and supplying the neighborhood with coffee in the morning, donuts, and whatever you get from these type of supermarkets, two things was lost. The generational wealth that he would have left for his family and his well-being during his lifetime, as well as his service to the community. Closing small markets made the bigger markets be able to come over and take that business. Yes. Well, let's move to um, to the Emancipation Proclamation painting that you painted, because one of our themes this year in our speaker series is persistence, and your story is very much about persistence. And you know, can you tell us both about you know the the story in this painting, and then point out some of, of the salient details for us? Well, the story of this painting, Emancipation Proclamation, is the last. It's the last in a series of paintings. I painted pictures. Um, I drew sketches first of things that every, whatever went in on in the courtroom and I could see it from my perspective. So I would try to draw a sketch or something and then later I would try to develop 
the sketch. So when you go back as far as back to the one we were speaking about, No ID, which was one of the very first ones uh, to try to tell the story, right? Um, this is the laugh. And this is a picture where I've pretty much filed every type of motion that you can file in federal court to get out of prison. To not to get out of prison, I really just want to be heard. I just want to present the evidence that, that we had. And by this time, we, are, we have identified the person who committed the crime and everything. We just want to get in court and, and, and see it. And uh, President Obama gets elected, which we already talked about. I painted him as the president in 2007, over a year before he got elected. And I painted a, multiple events that I saw in my mind that seemed like they came to pass. Well, this, I got a lot of ridicule for this painting. When I'm looking at it now, and I haven't saw it in a while. Um, everybody, and, uh, now I ain't gonna say everybody, a lot of people in the prison laughed at me. They're like, man, you crazy. You think the president going, you, you gonna paint a picture? You think you, the president care about you? Da, 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 da. I said, look, man, I don't know. I mean, I didn't file every motion and then reading the book because I still believe in the law. I still believe in our system. You know, I still support our system. Even though I believe in criminal justice reform, I still believe in, in having laws in, in government, but I think they need to work right. So when you read the books, the last reprieve for a federal prisoner is to go to the president of the United States, whoever's sitting at the time, and ask for mercy, ask for a pardon, ask for a commutation, right? And so we applied for a commutation. And while we waited, I continue to paint on this picture. I say, well, I don't have nothing else to do now, but just a last step. If this one here fell and I don't go home, then I don't know what I'm gonna paint next because it won't be inside of this system. There won't be nothing else left in the system. And so when I finally made it to the end, I painted this picture. This picture is so detailed and I can't say it's really my most detailed because I start to, my emotions kind of go up and down. And you, so one day you can paint real good, the next day you can't, depending on what's going on inside the prison. It, it's a, the, your environment keeps changing. But you can read every word on that paper inside the paint. The paint is only a 24 inch by 36 inch. You can read every word in the one that Neil Elgerson is, is, is holding. This painting has uh, every book in the corner behind Mr. Brown, who was the supervisor of education, who allowed me a, a, a space inside of the prison to paint. So I had an inside of the prison place to paint in private. And we had an outside hobby shop where I teach at and I could work out there when the library area wasn't open. But those books have all of the denials. Every time I filed a motion, they denied it. It came out in a book. This is the history. This is the history that they write that they want everybody to believe. And this is the history that I'm challenging. That's why it's in the picture. These are a whole bunch of books of lies and you're using lies on, that you made up on me to punish other people. That's where the corruption part get wrong at. But we are sitting here in front of everybody who I felt at the time uh, that had something to do with my incarceration as far as releasing me. We have the uh, partner attorney, we have uh, the, uh, the chief prosecutor, L Loretta Lynch and Eric, um, Eric Holden. Uh, we had the vice president at the time, Joe Biden, which I painted him as a president as well. I think you can see it behind me. Um, but yeah, and I got my hand pulled back away from the paper with the pen still in the, in the quill, the quill still in the ink bottle, because I can't sign that paper if you want me to have remorse. And it, the paper wants you to do a statement of remorse. I can't have remorse for something that I didn't do. And I, I have not been rehabilitated. It's two statements, I, I couldn't fill the paper out. And I gave up. I said, look, they tried eight different ways to write it. They handed it to me and said, nah, that's still saying that I'm sorry and I'm not sorry for nothing. You know, I haven't done anything. I'm not sorry, I don't have no remorse. And so we go back and forth for a year and something with that argument, what are you gonna do about number five and number seven? It's nothing I can do about it. So I did a, a motion to my attorney and told him that I would die before I would sign a paper. They have me lying and saying that I'm remorseful for something I didn't do. And so we was at the standoff. Eventually they took this painting from my understanding of uh, James Feldman, which is the lawyer with the red and white tie and, and Catherine, uh, the other attorney who actually did the writing 
on my petition. They went to, um, they took the picture to the White House and they thought it was a photograph. And that started the investigation into my case and them questions about number five and seven. Eventually, I believe, and I haven't talked to Obama yet. We're working on that now. They, they did call a couple of weeks ago and ask, did I have anything I wanted him to sign as they try to put this little thing together? Um, I don't know. I lost my frame of thought. I started, <laughs> I started going too deep in it. Can, can you talk a little bit about the, the picture um, on the wall behind? Um, oh, yeah, that's mm -hmm. a funny one. Let me talk about all, all three paintings I painted here. And you gotta, gotta realize these paintings are super tiny, right? They start with the one in the center of the picture, which a lot of people mistake it as being the Last Supper. I took the, the prison guards that I work with and I put them in all the, the faces of the people in there best I could. The guy in the middle with the blonde hair in the blue eyes, that's Will Russell. That was my, um, my, I worked with him every day. I worked with Will every day. He was uh, uh, my supervisor when I was a dental technician, making uh, dentures for the other inmates and in all the prisons in this region. Uh, when that part closed down, he became uh, in education. He became uh, my supervisor in education. The guy with the white hair to the left, Mr. Brown, standing in front of the bookcase, was his boss and also my boss. So he didn't want to put the picture. He didn't want to give me a photograph to put him in the painting. So, but every time when the newspaper and stuff come, he always speaks positive for me in the public. So I went and got a newspaper clipping and I took it and put him in there, but I, he's bald headed. He don't have no hair. He got the big bald spot. So I gave him a full head of hair and I was able to finish the painting right up under his eye. And he didn't recognize himself because he couldn't even imagine himself to have hair. And uh, I got it off and I took the guys from out of uh, CMS and I painted them into the picture. I wanted everybody who I thought that was real people who was able to see a human being to be a human being and not a prisoner, it's not guard prisoner, that's a person. You know, I never treated them any different than being a man and the women that was there respect was a, wimp, was a women. And the ones that showed back that same respect, I remember their faces, I, re, I still feel their spirits living with me today. So I, I painted him in there. Now on the other side, you got Abraham Lincoln in black and white because I wanted people to always remember throughout time, if I never returned home, that this scene right here is not a scene that I just fully created. But so I don't want the play, plagiarism, plagiarism. You know, this, I'm titled it the same thing as the other one is titled. It's the Emancipation Proclamation, but it came from the picture that's in the corner. And then behind me is the judge. I had to give my judge uh, his props in my life and I wanted to record it because this is how I paint history. I don't write it in the book and write the story and then publish it in the book. See, they put them books in, the books behind there, that's the history of a lie that they told, but I had to turn that lie around and show in a painting something different. I'm, I'm gonna give you props that you go look at them numbers, you're gonna find my name. But also look at the picture behind the back. That's a picture of the judge, me standing before the judge in shackles and chains. LA County jail clothes, federal clothes walking out, the arrow pointing to the prison that way, and I'm going the opposite way of the arrow. And the judge is pointing his finger, holding a ticket in his hand saying life without parole. So this is my sentence. I took, I painted that picture when I was, uh, I waited three and a half, almost four years at the Supreme Court level. And during that time, I painted a thousand something bricks as I counted the days. I painted a brick, I painted a brick, I painted a brick. And so that picture, the original picture is uh, three feet by two feet. I think it has a thousand and six or a thousand and eight bricks in it. I forget the number, somewhere right around a thousand bricks. I was so tired of painting that picture and painting them bricks. I, I asked myself many times, why did I ever start? You know, but anyway, yeah, that's what's going on in this picture right here. Loretta oh. Lynch, she looks very curious. She's looking at me like, what? And Obama's trying to explain. And I'm like, can't do it, sorry. 
Wow. Yeah. Th thank you for that, Mr. Wash. Um, Mr. Norland, if you can stop sharing for a minute, I think uh, I want to ask you one more thing before we go to questions and answers. So people mm -hmm. in the audience, if you want to start putting questions into the chat, we'll, we'll relay them to Mr. Wash. But I just want to ask, you're such a positive person. Um, can you talk about how you see the glass as, as uh, half full rather than half empty? Yes, yes, I can. I mean, um, I'm an optimist. I guess that's the right word you call it. I'm an optimist. Mm -hmm. that it's to each individual's choice, you know, to what you do, like we did with the time chart. You know, you can wait until you get to a, per a certain part and say that half my life is gone. Or you can say my life starts right here and this is how much I got in front of me. And what I'm going to do with this, even if you realize you wasted it in the back. I look at every opportunity um, that comes along. There is no bad. There's no bad. You know, say I lost uh, 25 years of my life. You know, some people look at it and say, oh, man, you lost 25 years of your life. No, I didn't. My body had to stop moving around for 25 years, but my mind and my spirit was as strong as ever. So I took that to say, okay, if I can't do the things that I'm used to doing, which is laying, welding things and cutting iron and building and fabricating buildings and doing that, that was my public service, my, my, my gift to society. What can I do from here today? This is a new world and I still find whether it's inside the prison walls or outside the prison walls, the people still need, they need help, they need support, they need guidance, they need, the sharing of knowledge. So I, I couldn't teach welding. I needed to learn something new because I figured by the time I got out, I'd be too old to weld. And then as I learned it, I taught it. I teach, I just, everything I get, I just share it right back out. Some of you said, man, why you, why would you do that? They used to ask me all the time. Mr. Watch, why do you teach all the people how to paint and draw? And then they making more cars than you and they making a lot of money. I said, well, I wasn't doing it for the money. I was doing it because I need to, to learn and grow for me. And then they needed the money. You know, I need money for my lawyers, but I can only do so much. Why do I hold on to the extra that I got that I can't even use when you see somebody can really do something good with it and you share? So being an op, uh, op, say the word, say it. What is it called? An optimist. I'm optimist. <laughs> yeah. Optimist. Be the optimist. The glass is always full for me. And for each one of y'all that's watching, the choice is going to always be yours. Whether you take the situation that you on your skateboard and you slip and fall, you know, to get up and never skate again or to figure out why you slip and fall and then figure out how not to do that again and keep on going, you know, and you, you'll finally achieve where it is that you're trying to go. Failures don't mean defeat. It just means that, okay, that didn't work. Analyze it first and figure out what went wrong and why it didn't happen. And then don't let that happen again and just keep on going. So, and that's what I do in life at every stage, at every stage. If I wake up late, I can't complain about waking up late. I say, okay, wow, it, it's not four o'clock. It's five o'clock in the morning. I just take off right there and go. So that's- so inspirational, Mr. Wash. Um, I want to just um, share some some thoughts and some questions from the audience. So um, when you were talking about your timeline, somebody put uh, and and about writing the best things that happen and and the worst things that happen. Somebody wrote. Uh, Therese Collins wrote. I spent my time listening to this inspiring artist. So. <laughs> Please know that you're making a difference. That was lovely. Um, we have a question about what were the most supportive programs you found in prison? And is there a way that we could support those? You know, Well, for me, I'm, I'm going to have to say hands down that um, the arts and hobby shop was the most supportive for me. Um, I found that I found myself in a very, very strange place that really didn't have anything to offer me. You know, there was, you know, remember I told you in the beginning, it was very hard to get into the hobby shop uh, to get a seat because you have 4,000 people and you only have less than uh, 15 seats. And so that rotation was just like, it didn't make sense to me. And I fought against it. And eventually, but then I was only at that prison from 1997 to 2000. But like I say, I, I did make the newspaper the first year. 
uh, which caused almost really a lot of bad stuff happening because they didn't want me to do that. I it was, it wasn't my choice. But the thing is, the positive side about it, regardless of what they felt, is that people saw and they believed that art could make a difference. And I was able to convince the staff to give me a room for the rest of the people. And I could teach them in that room. Even if they can't go in this room, give me a new room. And, and they did. And we was able to expand that program. I thought that uh, that was one of the best things. But I think over the top that most of them, where everyone I went to, they do have a library. And a library is a knowledge center. It's like how I'm finding YouTube is now. New, hey, this YouTube thing, this right here, listen, if I, when I was 16, 17 years old, if I could hit a button, if I could hit a button and get what you get out of YouTube, my God, my life would be so much different now. You know, you don't have to go on there and listen to songs and stuff. It got everything you can think of that you want to know. You know, when I was a child, this is another story, kind of a little bit off topic. When I was a child and all my sisters and brothers, and you know, it was like, it was nine of us. So I come from a big family. I have a large family, but they wanted toys and, and dresses and shoes. And I wanted encyclopedias. You know, after my first, the family had an encyclopedia and I used to come home and try to find, you know, things in the encyclopedia to do my lessons. I got caught. I got caught in all the knowledge of it. And I actually read three complete encyclopedia books during my youth going to school, you know, and, and three encyclopedia books. And I think I read four dictionaries from front to back. The thing that what I missed is that I did it in silence and I didn't talk it out. So I still have a pronunciation issue, not a comprehension issue. That's where the art come in because I can't say the words. So I have to paint it out, get frustrated because I can't say the words. It's just my tongue don't say those words. But yeah, um, that's... <laughs> that's amazing, Mr. Wash. Everything that you say is it's just so inspirational and so applicable to everybody out there in terms of how we see the world and how we grapple with our experiences. Um, I know Mr. Norland has a, a question he wants to relay from a student. Okay, come on. Yes, so I had a, a student ask the question, what subjects interest you now that you are out of prison? How will you choose the subjects you paint now? Oh, hey, very good question. My environment always kind of dictates and control what, you know, you, you, the five senses we look, we see, we smell, we touch, we taste. And then those things paint pictures in my mind. I try to paint them out. So now that I'm out and I have been blessed to, to leave the country several times, uh, to leave uh, California several times, as I see things that's happening, I would probably paint, when I see that somebody don't have a voice to say what I know you're trying to say, then those would be the next subjects. You know, in prison, that small segment of artwork that went around the pains and sorrows that, that people were going through, that they couldn't bear to say it out loud. Now that I'm on the streets, I find a whole lot of things that people are going through with all this racial unrest and all this, they, they're afraid to say it. I see so much fear, even more. I thought that when I was in prison, I had seen the most fear that I would ever see in my lifetime. But once this pandemic came and you walk to the store and you pass people, they are so afraid. They used to be afraid of, of a look that, um, you know, being a black person and being kind of stout, muscular or whatever, that, you know, fear of they're gonna get robbed or beat or mugged. Now, when they look at you, they have a fear that they're gonna die and catch COVID. And it's such a weird thing to walk, like just walk to a liquor store, or go into a supermarket and everybody is pulling away from everybody, like trying to put the two poles of a magnet together. It's like, you know, we can't touch, we can, you know, it's really weird. So I have to, I haven't yet did a, a COVID painting. I did do a few COVID sketches that I kind of want to try to tell this story about COVID. Um, but yes, that's my next uh, set of paintings. I want to travel the world and I want to try to at least create one painting that tells the story of each one of the continents. I think we got like one, each one of the countries, we got 128 countries, I think it is, in the world, something like that. So I got 128 paintings to get done before I die. And I don't have a lot of time, <laughs> so yeah.
Next person, come on, what we got? Well, uh, another question is, is, is there a tip that you would give sort of not necessarily related to um, overcoming all of the adversity that, that you've overcome, but simply sort of a, 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 a tip in terms of making art? Um, is there a tip that you would offer to students and sort of how, how to? Well, uh, yeah, there's, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you, everything comes in threes, right? It's three sides to every story, the right, the wrong, and the truth. So um, one of the tips is that I'm going to say, first of all, a lot of people don't be able to create art because they have not been taught how to see. They don't see nothing. You know, you give them a blank canvas and they be like, they stuck. They don't see nothing. You give them, tell them to look at something and draw it. They don't see it. Um, so one of my tips would be is to take away what you think when you look at something, whatever it is you want to paint. Like, oh, look at me. Okay, everybody on the screen is looking and you see me. You want to paint Mr. Wash. Okay, so you're looking at me. I'm the subject right now take me out and see what else you see. So you have to paint the locker, you got to paint the flower, you got to paint the other painting in the back, you got to paint uh, the paintbrushes, all that. If you do all of that, then you would feel Mr. Wash before he's ever painted. So I, that's what I try to teach the people is how to see. And then once you get inside of each one of the things that you see, you have to always ask that you only see it because there's light. And every time there's light, there's a shadow. And look for the shadows. Because I couldn't see in prison. I was actually was wearing these jewelers things in order to, to see, because they didn't give me glasses for six years. And it was kind of dingy and dark. So my eyes went really, really bad. I had surgery since I've been home uh, on both eyes. And I'm waiting for two more surgeries now. But I painted the shadows. So a lot of pictures you see is I look for the dark spots and put them in and just play and look for the light, you know? And so that would be, uh, that was two, huh? Okay, the third thing to start the story is pay attention to what they gave you when you first came in. They gave you an artbywatch.com. We're working diligently to open up an art class, which will be both online and in person as soon as we can get established in a building. And that way we'll have a constant communication from wherever I'm at in the world. I'll pick my phone up. I'll check in and, and see the class where I'm checking in with y'all now. I get a chance to see your work. And then I can help explain. Like you ask me a question, I give you an answer. You show me something, I can tell you what to do to make it better. And so I'll be there for you. That's what I'm trying to say. Wonderful. We have a question from Key and Power. Um, what, what have been and will continue to be your most important relationships? Mm. Well, the ones that's been most important is going to always be the most important. That's the, my relationship with God, my, the spiritual side of my life. That's the, this physical life. Um, it's here is we only passing through. So uh, I think that my spiritual connection, understanding that this life is a temporary one and that I'm only passing through uh, with an infinite, an indefinite amount of time then I maintain that relationship above all else. You know, um, my relationship with God is the most important thing that I understand that you, you, me, Amy, everybody, we all the spirits of God and we experience in life in human form. We had no choice whatsoever, whether we was going to come out male or female, uh, brunettes or blonde, whether we're going to come out uh, Hispanic, white, Asian, black, we didn't get a choice of the kind of car we was gonna ride around in. Some people get the Rolls Royce, some of you get the Volkswagen, some people get the Porsche. Okay, so we got different bodies, but we are still all the same spirit. We are still, we are human spirits. We are humans, we are spirits of God experiencing life in human form. These bodies that we have is just the car we drive while we here. And I understand it so clearly. I don't really wanna get into that for real, for real, because it might not be appropriate, but it, it had to be said right now. You know, when you pull up, if you're driving a Chevrolet Mustang, I mean, a Mustang, and you pull up on a Chevy, don't be mad because they're driving a Chevy. You don't pull up, pull up on a Mexican person or an Asian person. Don't be mad because they trapped in Asia, in an Asian body. I'm going to give you a quick story, and I know our time is limited. I wish we could do this for hours. 
when I went to Africa in 2019, I got locked out of the compound. The Uber people, they dropped me off and they took off and left. And I didn't have the clicker to unlock the, the left gate. So I ended up sitting out there yelling and hollering and then people start coming out. And out of respect, you could tell waking people up is two o'clock in the morning, you know, and we didn't went, went out or whatever, had dinner and everybody got dropped off. They dropped me off and I left the clicker to open the electric gate at the other place. So I ended up sleeping on the streets, just up against the pole. And I got woke up by a dog. The dog was like kind of afraid of me, you know, and like kind of defensive. I look at it and say, look. I wake up and it's cold and I've got dew on me. My clothes are wet and, you know, and the dog look at me and he kind of like raises his hands up a little bit. I say, oh my God, you got you trapped in the dog's body, huh? And he looked and his hair laid down. He came and laid down beside me and we slept there for, <laughs> we slept there for a while. It, I'm only saying that to say that all life is part of the same spirit that gives life. And if, if when you don't have no fear of yourself, then you don't have to have fear of nothing else. And you can live with that. The dog understood that he came and, and put his hairs down and laid down. He knew I was cold and we just kind of laid there. And then after that, we kind of dozed off a little bit. Then next thing I know, I heard the electric gate open up and I went on back in the compound. So what else we got? Well, we have two minutes left. Do you have any final words of wisdom you would like to share with us today? Well, yeah, in the last two minutes, um, I just want to say to everybody again, thank you for allowing me to share uh, part of your life, to share the spirit that's inside of me, to deliver the messages of whatever of my experience. And hopefully that what you heard something today that each one person in here uh, heard something today that planted a seed that you can find the water and nourishment for to grow into something that will make your life more positive. In, in leaving, I just want to give caution caution about whatever you do in life do it fairly and not let it be part of the seven one of the seven deadly sins don't let it be because of greed uh envy lust jealousy gluttony uh spiteful you know uh let it be fair you know treat person place and thing the way that you would want to be treated if you was that Imagine this. I'm just giving you a little imagination, right? Imagine that you were a tree. You're alive. You bear fruit. You grow. You feel the wind. You, you shed leaves like we shed our skin. But you can't move. So if you're the tree and you had all the feelings that you had, but you didn't have no mouth to express it, how would you want to be treated? So Think about that, that everything that have life is all part of the same spirit. So we, and we all have a cycle in the time. We're only here to help one another. The trees come, they give us fruit, they give us carbon, the, the oxygen in exchange for our carbon dioxide. We all working together on this same thing. Just respect everything and everybody. And let's, let's make this thing happen. As soon as I can, I'm gonna put together a place and hopefully uh, y'all uh, follow me on Instagram. And go to Art by Watch from time to time and, and look at the news and events page and see what else we got new going on. I'm going to try to open up a school a classroom, virtual and physical, that when the pandemic and stuff is over with, that you have somewhere to come visit on field trips, the educational system, inviting them in the way they invited me in. You know, one thing about it, when you mess with me, I'm going to make you rich and make you famous. <laughs> oh, Mr. Wash, this was wonderful. We have a couple comments I'll just share with you in closing. Um, one of our art teachers, Ms. Corona, says this was beautiful and inspiring, Mr. Washington. Thank you for sharing yourself with us. We are better for knowing you. And um, let's see, um, one of our students, Ryan Doherty, says, thank you for inviting us to this meeting. I learned a lot. Um, Ms. O'Boyle, who you know, who's our uh, assistant head of school, says, thank you. I will likely watch this talk multiple times over the years. Your wisdom is timeless and so needed. Um, our head of school, Dr. Cron, thanks you very, um, very much for being here with us. Um, students, there is a link that Mr. Norland put into the chat for your reflections, and we'll share your thoughts with Mr. Wash. Mr. Ooh. Wash, 
thank you again for being with us. It was okay. beautiful. Okay, you're so welcome. I want to thank everybody. With one last shout out, when if this pandemic opened, I think somebody told me, called me and said that we like 50% open for the museums. For all of y'all that's able, if you're in, in the area of um, Los Angeles, please go to the Hammer or the Huntington uh, Library, Hammer Museum on Wilshire or the Huntington Library. Uh, support them with the Made in LA, Marion and Lauren and, and Ike. Um, yes, come, okay. let's go have, let's have some fun. It's a beautiful exhibition and you can find Mr. Wash's talk from last week, I'm sure on, on YouTube where he, he spoke in the Hammer Museum lecture series and it, it was also just wonderful. So there's so much to learn and eventually there's going to be a PBS film and um, we look forward to your next steps and are, and are just so honored that you shared your time with us. Thank you again. Thank you all. Good night. All right. Take care everyone. Thanks for being here.